everybody. Um, it's uh, uh, a pleasure for me to introduce the fifth um, in a series of webinars which have been uh, put together by the uh, Canadian Pollination Initiative here in Canada. And it may seem a little odd that uh, we should be addressing coffee um, pollination in the Americas. Um, in as much as Canada is not a producer of coffee, it's a consumer certainly. And uh, we really sort of um, um, want to uh, <coughs> um, go ahead with the introduction. Uh, one of the things we have to, apart from thanking the Canadian Pollination Initiative, which was sponsored by the uh, Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, um, we have to acknowledge that the International Union of Biological Sciences has provided uh, money which has enabled us to do some work on coffee pollination and uh, other aspects of coffee crop protection uh, through the International Commission for Plant Pollinator Relations and uh, as administered by the Arthur Dobbs Institute, a not-for-profit uh, institute for research, development, innovation and education. So with those organizations in mind, we've been able to put this together and share with you today the experiences of uh, Dr. Remy Van Damme um, in Chiapas in Mexico and his work on uh, coffee and coffee pollination and uh, then uh, Carlos Vergara and his experience with coffee pollination and uh, coffee production uh, issues that uh, he's been working on in uh, primarily the state of Veracruz in, in Mexico. So I understand that Remy is going to go forward first. So uh, Remy, thank you for joining us. Uh, we're looking forward to hearing what you have to tell us. Can you hear me? Just, I hope you are uh, watching me or at least hearing me. Can you confirm that I can go ahead? Go ahead, Remy, you're um, fine. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I'm very happy to, to be with you today and thanks very much, um, Carlos for, uh, and Peter for inviting me for this session. Uh, just I have a, still a, a technical problem. I don't see my own presentation. Um, where, where should I see it? Can you help me with that? So Remy, so Remy I have your presentation have loaded. Your loaded. Okay. If you can't okay. see it, you could always say next slide okay. and I can advance okay. and you can look at it in is, your PowerPoint or something. PowerPoint. Yeah, this is perfect. Okay, well, hello everybody. I am talking to you from uh, Chiapas in Mexico, from San Cristobal de las Casas. Um, the, uh, we are in the tropics here, but even though it's a pretty cold day, we have uh, 55 degrees here uh, because the elevation is about uh, 7,000 feet above sea level. But at about an hour from here, we have a lot of uh, coffee plantations, and this is where we work about daily. So what I want to, um, uh, to explain today is uh, some work about around the diversity of bees in coffee landscapes in Mexico and in Guatemala. So the next slide. Um, when we think in pollination, we have to consider that uh, pollination is a mutualism, uh, that is, Plants need bees for pollination, but also bees need plants for food, uh, for feeding the bees with nectar and pollen, and for nesting sites. So it's re really there is a, a strong mutualism between between uh, plants and bees. So if we think it from the coffee plantations, we can make two questions: How good are coffee plantations for the bees and their diversity, and how uh, how good are the bees for coffee pollination? Or in other words, what is the ideal combination between food production and biodiversity con uh, conservation? This is a question we make in a field of research which is called uh, agroecology. 
And to try to answer, to answer this question, we are going to think in two places of Latin America, first in Costa Rica. Uh, as you can see um, on the picture on the top left, um, the uh, coffee in, in Costa Rica is mainly sun brown coffee. This means there, is, there are no trees in the coffee plantation. And at the bottom right in Mexico, uh, we have shade grown coffee, which, which means that above the coffee shrubs, uh, there are plenty of trees giving shade to the, to the coffee. And uh, next slide, we are now in the slide number four. Um, let's think first what's happened in uh, Costa Rica. I'm going to show here some data from Jaime Flores when he was a master student uh, in Costa Rica, um, where he has been studying the diversity of bees depending on the extension of forest around the uh, coffee plantation. So he has been working in four different landscapes. Uh, these are the four plots here. In the center, in brown, we have the coffee plantation. And around, in green, the extension of forest. So at the bottom left, you can see a, a landscape with uh, very few forests around the um, coffee plantation. And the number of bees on the coffee flowers when was only two species of bees with 13 individuals. On the bottom right, uh, it's about the same number of species and individuals. At the top left, uh, we have more forest, and the number of species of bees is seven, with 58 in individuals. And at the bottom, uh, the top right, um, with even more forest, we have 14 species of bees and 117 uh, individuals. So it is very clear from here that having more forest means um, having more bees, uh, more individuals, and from more species. Next slide, the number five. This is uh, pretty important for, for coffee pollination. This is a work by uh, Taylor Ricketts, um, working together with uh, Jaime Flores, to, uh, still in Costa Rica. Um, what they are showing here is that, uh, considering the free landscape, um, the uh, making observations of the species of bees arriving on the coffee flowers, they are showing that, that Apis mellifera is pretty constant uh, in all the coffee crops, whatever the distance from the forest. But in uh, uh, dark gray, um, if we are very clear, very close to the to the forest, we have not only Apis mellifera but also a high number of native bees. So there is a very strong relation uh, between being close to the forest and having uh, more bees. Uh, this, this has an impact on the coffee pollination and the co and the coffee productivity. I won't enter into details here because Carlos Vergara after me will uh, uh, give more data on this. But what uh, Ricketts uh, has shown is that being close to the forest, having more bees, the productivity of coffee has, is increased in around 20%, which means um, higher income of about 400 US dollars per hectare uh, of coffee plantation. Um, so forest is giving bees, and bees are giving pollination, and pollination is giving at the end uh, uh, money. Uh, so there is a strong relation between uh, coffee uh, conservation and also the economy of the coffee plantation. Let's move now to Mexico and the slide number six. As I said initially, uh, the coffee in Mexico and also in Guatemala is very different with a lot of shade of shade trees, uh, high diversity of trees giving shade to, to coffee. We have been studying that in, uh, in Chiapas, uh, the southeast of Mexico, and also in Guatemala. Next slide. Uh, we have been working on 35 uh, coffee landscapes along the gradient of heterogeneity of the landscape and also a gradient of shade diversity. It means, uh, shade diversity means 
uh, in landscape where where there are a lot of um, different trees giving shade and also a landscape with low and uh, low number of, of trees species giving shade. Um, I just want to bring your attention on the picture of the bottom right, uh, this forest, which is in Guatemala. It looks like a forest. It is a forest, but under the canopy there is only coffee uh, shrubs, coffee plantations. So this is an amazing example of uh, combination between coffee plantation and uh, conservation of the, of the forest. So the questions we wanted to answer in Mexico and in Guatemala are two in the slide number eight. Has the land use an impact on the bee community? And if so, is this impact different for each species? So as I said, we have been studying a uh, longer gradient of uh, 35 landscapes, which is on the bottom right. This figure is showing in yellow and red, you can see the proportion of coffee plantations in the, in the landscape. The slide number 10. Uh, in these 35 sites, we have been sam sampling for about 200 uh, days. Um, we collected about 9,000 bees. And slide number 11, um, making an analysis, what we have seen is that the, uh, obviously the, the community of bees is different along the, depend, depending on the landscapes. But the species of bees and the depending, depending the group of bees, of bees have a different response. For example, here we see in uh, red that the social bees are um, depending very much on what's happening in the landscape on a radius of 2,000 meters around the coffee crop. Um, and for the solitary bees, um, the, the um, diversity of bees and the abundance of uh, bees when uh, thinking in solitary bees um, is depending on what's happening on a radius of, of 260 meters. So this is showing that um, the bee community is uh, depending again of uh, how is the land use around the coffee plantation. The next slide, we have made um, an analysis um, genus by genus of bees and uh, I won't enter into much detail here because it's pretty compli complicated data but what we can see on the right in yellow um, the second bar CC means uh, the effect of the complex coffee uh, crop it means coffee with uh, diverse uh, canopy diverse uh, number of trees giving the shade to, to the coffee. And we are seeing, seeing that in this case, uh, the effect is negative for the genus, uh, for the bees of the genus Trigona. If we go on the slide number 13, um, we, are, we can see what's happening for six different uh, genera of bees. And we can see for Trigona a negative effect of uh, complex coffee crops. Also for Trigonisca, but if we go to the to the other right for the genus uh, Senagochlora, um, also the, the effect is negative. Uh, but at the end for Lasioglossum, which is a genus of solitary bees, uh, the effect is very positive. So oh, this shows that overall uh, we need forest for having bees. But um, the effect is not the same depending Uh, we just uh, have have lost connection uh, with Remy in uh, in Chiapas, um, but he was just coming to his conclusion slide, um, and uh, I would be happy to deliver that. Um, 
so one of the things that comes out of, uh, of Remy's studies um, in Guatemala and in Mexico, and uh, similarly other studies which have been conducted in other parts of the world, uh, from uh, uh, all, all the way from Southeast Asia and uh, Australasia, uh, through to Africa is that coffee pollination and productivity depends on bee abundance and diversity. We know there's a positive relationship there um, and that bee abundance and diversity depend on land use uh, at a large scale. So it's not just the immediate land use, but also uh, extending out about uh, two kilometers or, or so. And depending on the group of bees, um, the, uh, the, the scale varies then from a couple of kilometers to uh, a, a, a couple of hundred meters, but it's still uh, extensive. So the importance of the forest surrounding the coffee plantations so is now I fairly well I documented. Oh, we have Remy back. I'm at your conclusion point number four. Okay. okay. Go, go ahead, Remy. Sorry, did, 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 did you lose? Did you lose? Yeah. yeah. I, I, I went uh, to. Uh, should I read it? Uh, from number four onwards. From from here and here. Okay. 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 So I was saying that um, at the end. Um, well, uh, there is a, an impact of forest uh, at the landscape level. Uh, so, so, excuse me. At the landscape level, there is a big importance of forest for the um, uh, coffee plantation. And at the local level, there is an importance of shade diversity. So, uh, at the end, the final idea, which is, uh, I think, very important, is that the positive impact of the forest inside and around uh, the coffee plantation are for the coffee production. Uh, for, that is for the economy and for the people, but also uh, the impact is very, very positive for uh, biodiversity conservation, for natural scenery, for car carbon uh, sequestration, for storing water, uh, for producing honey, for wood production. Um, this is to, as the last idea is that um, uh, the coffee in the tropics are good for the production and for the economy, but also very much for the for the people and for the environment. So with this, I am finishing my talk. I ha I hope you can you could follow me, and I will be happy to listen, Carlos, and yeah, then and try then to answer questions. Thank you very much, Remy. Um, and uh, now we'll hear from uh, uh, Carlos Vegara, who's working in. Uh, not quite such a tropical area, but still uh, a, a somewhat tropical, so semi-tropical area in central Veracruz in Mexico, again explaining uh, his results. Again, I think we'll see that these results that Carlos is going to describe are uh, in fact in concert and are some pioneering studies um, that uh, have helped others who are interested in coffee uh, pollination and uh, production. So, Carlos, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, uh, and thank you to the Canadian Pollination Initiative for this invitation to present uh, the work I have been uh, doing for the last um, few years in, in Mexico, in Veracruz. Um, well, I want to start with uh, some general concepts. Uh, well, pollination as most of us know, is the transfer of pollen grains from the male to the female parts of flowers. And uh, that can happen between two different plants or within the same plant, within the same flower, or between different flowers from the same plant. Um, and these are the most important pollinators. Insects are the most important pollinators. And therefore, uh, uh, main uh, groups in, in insects, which are very important for pollination, especially bees, which uh, are probably more than 80% of the individuals that move pollen around between flowers. 
in coffee we have um, the, uh, the, the plants produce many flowers. These are white flowers, very um, uh, odorous, very beautiful flowers, small flowers. And in these flowers we have the, anther, the anthers producing pollen and the stigma re receiving the pollen that the anthers produce. We have two species of coffee which are important economically. Coffea canephora, which is called robusta or lowland coffee, or coffea robusta is another name for, for it. It is, uh, as uh, the name implies, the lowland coffee is grown in uh, low altitudes. I don't know what happened. Okay. Um, we have uh, a, a robusta coffee in low altitudes, and we have the second uh, species, which uh, coffee is Coffea arabica, which is the highland coffee, uh, considered of better quality but and um, more valuable than than robusta. Arabica, uh, the highland coffee, is self-fertile, so it does not need cross-pollination to set berries. And uh, in the past, it has been considered that, bee, that bees or other insects did not play any role in uh, coffee production. But more, more recently, there are indications that started to, to uh, be studies on the effect of bees on coffee pollination and some researchers um, noticed that the plants that were caged with honeybees almost double the yield of, uh, of mature fruits versus plants that did not receive uh, bee visits. Also fruit retention which is a, another step on the production of berries um, also seem, seem to be enhanced by outcrossing. Here we have some information from Indonesia. Um, in the in the uh, production of, of coffea, coffea arabica, arabica coffee. Uh, here we, we see the uh, what Remy just mentioned that the number of bee species is important. It has an influence on the number of fruits that are produced, and that, that the forest distance here, as as far as distance or distance to the forest increases, the production of uh, fruits is lower. Um, Coffea arabica, as I said, is self-pollinated, but Coffea, uh, Coffea robusta, the lowland coffee, needs cross-pollination to set fruit. Um, we also know that uh, um, the, the, uh, the mass or the volume or the, the, the weight of the berries is higher when they, they have bee visits and also that the fewer pea berries which are um, coffee fruits that only have one seed normally one coffee fruit has two seeds but when the pollination is deficient um, coffee, fruit, coffee fruits um, set or produces only one seed that those are called pea berries and when uh, there is a, a sufficient insect pollination, there are fewer pea berries. <clears throat> so uh, insect, especially bee pollination, means bigger and better crops in, in coffee. <clears throat> there are beneficial effects of managed and wild pollinators, higher yields, better quality berries, more uniform maturation of berries, which is important when um, harvesting is done in a mechanical way. <clears throat> and also, as it was mentioned in, in, a, uh, in, a, in another uh, webinar, there is the uh, potential for pollination, for dissemination of biological control using bees. Um, now I'm going to focus on the situation of coffee in Mexico. Mexico is the 10th biggest producer of green coffee in the world. Um, there were uh, 
more than 700,000 hectares uh, grown in uh, or cultivated with coffee in, last year in Mexico. And coffee is the third most important commodity for export. And the three more important areas uh, that produce coffee in Mexico are Chiapas, as uh, was uh, shown by, by Remy earlier. Uh, Oaxaca, the state of Oaxaca, and the state of Veracruz on the Gulf Coast. The, there is, this map shows that uh, the areas that are considered uh, uh, very important for uh, conservation are in red, and the areas where coffee is grown are shown in green. And there is a, a big overlap of these two types of criteria, for example, here in Veracruz many or several in Chiapas and uh, some in, in Oaxaca. Um, during the, the 90s, there was a global crisis uh, in, in, the, in the coffee uh, sector because there was um, overproduction of coffee that, uh, uh, that uh, the consequence of that was that the prices were very low. So people responded in two ways mainly. They increased the level of uh, crop management to produce more coffee. And uh, other people just left the activity of coffee growing and converted the coffee farms mainly to sugar cane. And that had a detrimental effect on cloud forest in Mexico because uh, sugar cane is a, a crop that uh, doesn't need and uh, doesn't allow the presence of other plants in, in the crop and also is, is detrimental to soils and many other uh, factors. <clears throat> um, the, the cloud forest in Mexico and other parts of, of the world is very important to preserve bi biodiversity because it, uh, biodiversity of many uh, groups of, of organisms are very high, is very high in associated with this type of forest. This forest also harbors many endemic uh, animals and other organisms. That means that these species are only present in this type of uh, forests. And um, is one of the most endangered vegetation types in the world. In Mexico, it represents a very small area, only 1% of the total area of the country, but um, it is uh, probably the most, uh, the, the vegetation type, which is under highest human pressure, uh, uh, several uh, medium and small uh, cities in Mexico are within uh, cloud forest vegetation. So to tackle these problems, um, a, a, a project was uh, uh, set in place. Um, and here in this slide, I, I emphasize the importance that uh, shade coffee farms have for, for Mexican families and for, for, Mexican, uh, for the Mexican economy and also for conservation, as uh, Remy mentioned earlier. So this uh, project, this three-year study, uh, included a, a project on the investigation of pollination of coffee along of what we call a gradient of management. Um, coffee manage uh, and the, the study area was in this area of central Veracruz, near the Gulf Coast of Mexico, in the altitudes between uh, uh, around 1,000 meters above, above sea level and 1,200 or 1,300 meters above sea level. So this is concerned with Arabica coffee, the, the high altitude coffee in Mexico. These are the main uh, traditional coffee production systems or management uh, systems of coffee, starting with rustic, which is um, uh, or preserves most of the original vegetation. Most of the original uh, bigger trees are preserved here. And also, the, that means the canopy is almost um, unchanged. Then we have a secondary layer of trees here. 
and coffee is planted in between these trees. This is called rustic, rustic um, coffee production system. Then we have something uh, similar, which is called traditional polyculture, but here some of the trees in the second layer are uh, replaced by uh, trees or plants that produce some economic, some economically important crop like uh, bananas or other crops. And also uh, some uh, trees, th some that produce timber are intermi intermingled with the original vegetation. Then we have what is called commercial polyculture where most of the canopy or all of the canopy is removed only a few um, trees of medium size are left and uh, these trees uh, usually are either fruit trees or timber trees, trees. Then we have what is called shaded monoculture and um, what we have here is one, only one species of trees is used for monoculture, for shade I mean, and below that um, that layer of trees, uh, coffee is planted. And then we have what is called unshaded monoculture, uh, where only um, coffee uh, shrubs or trees are left. There is no other species in the, in the, in the crop, and this is uh, highly uh, managed. Here we have that uh, uh, input is high, very the width of this bar or this triangle indicates how much input uh, is uh, present in, in every one of the uh, production systems and here how is biodiversity. So biodiversity is highest when um, little management is, is present and biodiversity is very low when uh, high input uh, is in the in the in the crop this was mentioned by by Remy earlier too but here we have all the um, five important um, production systems and what we did in our study was, was to compare how the management system um, influences B diversity or pollinator diversity and how is this related to coffee production. We have some previous studies that I already mentioned, some of them mainly in Brazil in the 50s through the 70s, then in Jamaica, one important study in that uh, showed that bees uh, caged with or plants, coffee plants caged with bees produce more berries in um, 2002, Rubik in Panama showed that uh, Africanized or African honeybees are very important for coffee production. Um, in 2003, Klein in Indonesia showed the relation between the number of bee species and the um, set of fruits in, in plants, and also the relation to forest distance and uh, how the, the relation uh, uh, of the density of bees uh, was with food set. <clears throat> what we did was we studied the richness, the species richness, that means the number of different uh, pollinators and other uh, characteristics of the pollinator community in every one of these four um, coffee production systems. We couldn't include the fifth one uh, because um, coffee tends to bloom simultaneously over uh, uh, big regions. That means when you have uh, the proper com combination of temperature and rain, coffee blooms uh, everywhere uh, in, in, in a big area, so we couldn't cover all the five, um, the five uh, uh, production systems. Uh, we had to exclude the traditional polyculture. We studied the rustic system, 
commercial polyculture, shaded monoculture, and unshaded monoculture, which uh, exist all in, in Veracruz. What we did we, was we used four farms, four different management systems, four sites per farm, and in every site we chose one coffee shop per site to do uh, censuses, observations of um, poll uh, pollinators, and, and we counted how many of them were present in 25-minute uh, censuses. And what we did was, this is what, what I mentioned just uh, in, the, in the previous slide, is this part of the study where we did observations to uh, measure pollination diversity and abundance. And simultaneously, we used in the same plots another four shrubs. We took five branches of in, in every shrub and we did these treatments. We left one branch open so every uh, all the insects could um, visit the plant and also we have the effect of wind pollination which is present for uh, Cofea Arabica and the uh, effect of self-pollination so we have the three factors working here, self-pollination, insect pollination, and wind pollination. Uh, then we took a second branch and we put a bag on, uh, around the flower, so we only have here self-pollination and to some extent wind pollination. We also did some uh, pollination our, ourselves if, with pollen from the same plant, with pollen from different plant, and, a fi and on a fifth branch, we took out the anthers to measure only uh, outcrossing, cross uh, pollination with pollen uh, from another from, a, from another uh, flower. Um, and here we we see the treatments, open pollination. We have here see a, a honeybee visiting uh, flowers. Here we have an explosion of pollinators. Inside this bag you can see the flower buds. We uh, bag the, the flowers before they open to, of course, to avoid confusing the results because if the flower was already open, it could have been pollinated by insects or other means. Here I have one of my students doing the hand pollination with a very fine uh, brush moving pollen from one uh, flower to another and at the end we measured the size of the fruits. In this study we couldn't measure the weight of the fruits because uh, uh, the fruits were collected by the growers before we, we were able to, to finish our study but we can use or we did use the size, the volume of the fruit as a measure of uh, size. And what we found is that the most abundant flower visitor in all uh, of the management system was the honeybee, the common honeybee, Apis mellifera, with more than 95% uh, of the visit, visits. The only native uh, bees that were present was this species of uh, stingless bee, which is used also for uh, honey producing in, in, in Veracruz and other parts of the, of the country, like Chiapas. And some other stingless bees, like this is the nest of one of those stingless bees in, in one of the, of the farms. There was a nest very close to to one of our study sites. And what we had was, um, as far as fruit set, fruit set is a measure of how many flowers become fruits. So we measure the percentage, percentage of flowers that became fruits under the five different treatments in the four different uh, uh, management systems. And what we see is that when we bag flowers, this is the darker bar here, we have, this line is the, the, the mean uh, seed flower. So when we bag flowers 
in all uh, management systems, we see that uh, the, the production of uh, or the fruit set is below average. And when we have open pollination in some cases, like here and here, we have a production of uh, the, the fruit set is also below average. And this to the fact that there are not enough pollinators in, 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 the, in the area where, where we were observing the plants. Uh, for the other uh, treatments, we see for all the, uh, the management systems that hand pollination using uh, pollen from a different plants always produced the bigger portion of fruit set. That means that even though uh, uh, Arabica coffee doesn't need cross-pollination, it does benefit from it. We prove here that when you use pollen from another plant, I mean outcrossing, we always have bigger fruit set. We did the same for, from, for fruit retention, which is the second phase of the production of, fruit, of fruits. Uh, when you already when you have one flower that has become a fruit that fruit has to stay in the plant attached to the branch and grow that's what is called fruit retention it doesn't uh, depend only on pollination it also depends on the physiological the status of the plant but pollination plays a role and here we have that again when uh, fruit retention is always lower, you have backed flowers, and it's higher with other treatments. Here you have uh, for unshaded monoculture, that is uh, the, the management system that, um, uh, that is, uh, yes? Uh, we're running out of time. Okay, I'll wrap up here. We one important thing is that um, beekeepers move thousands of colonies into the coffee farms during the blooming of coffee, and that has a negative effect, as we see here, it has a negative effect on species richness and a negative effect on diversity of uh, native pollinators. And we have here that food set is positively related to the number of species of pollinators to the diversity and uh, negatively correlated with, with the number of apis workers. So probably beekeeping uh, inside coffee plantations is not um, necessarily positive because there is a probably a overuse of bees in these conditions. And uh, here is my, uh, the team of students who were responsible for all this work. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Carlos. I uh, didn't really mean that you should uh, <laughs> uh, slip past all your conclusions quite so fast. Um, so perhaps uh, um, with that in mind, we'll have some questions coming from uh, various people who have joined us from around the world to uh, listen to this webinar. And I, one of the things I'd like to say before we go on is that uh, there is a great deal of interest uh, by uh, some of the coffee growers and the coffee uh, and the coffee industry um, in biodiversity in coffee plantations uh, around the world. And uh, this is uh, something which uh, our own company, Tim Hortons is very much involved in. Starbucks is interested in this exact same thing. And the Hans Neumann Stiftung in Germany is funding uh, research along these lines. And we are in uh, very close contact with the International Coffee Organization in respect of this. Um, so the first question, is there any relation between bee size and the distance to the forest as far as coffee pollination is concerned? So um, uh, I'll leave that to either Carlos or, uh, or Remy to uh, chime in.
I hope you can listen, listen to me. Um, actually, it was a question of Carlos, so I guess it was for me. And um, and yes, there is a very strong relation. We know in general that um, the bigger the bees, the further they would uh, forage from their nest. And uh, so uh, bigger bees will tend to go further from the forest and inside the, the coffee plantation. Um, so, so the size of the bee is important. Um, uh, solitary bees tend to be small bees, like Lasioglossum, for example, and so this is why we find them uh, very close to the edge of the forest and not very far from the forest in the coffee plantation. But it's, it's, the size is not the, the only reason. For example, uh, Melipona vichieri, which is a stingless bee, a stingless bee about the size of Apis mellifera, uh, wouldn't fly uh, as far as Apis mellifera. So there is a, an effect of the size, but also there is a, a life history trait, depending on the, on the bees, explaining the, the diversity of bees in, in the coffee plantation. Thank you. Okay, there is a question on uh, are mellifera commercially introduced to the coffee plants? Yes, uh, in Mexico, in the area where I did my study, coffee is one of the important uh, blooms for beekeepers. That's why they move so many colonies into the coffee the coffee farms. Uh, but but as as I mentioned. Uh, the excessive number of uh, honeybees in coffee farms could have negative effects on the production of, of coffee because uh, honeybees outcompete many of the native pollinators so they tend to monopolize the resource and uh, lower the diversity of visitors to to coffee plants Well, no, I haven't done any, any studies on, on uh, caffeine contents of coffee uh, related to, to Apis mellifera behavior, but uh, there is indication that the quality, which is subjective because it is um, the, the quality of the, of the coffee produced as far as flavor and aroma and other things, is concerned has to do has some uh, uh, relation with the size and the weight of the of the berry so it is related to pollination i don't know if remy has anything to and add to may to i this. add about um, coffee honey that is honey of coffee flower. excuse me Uh, excuse me, I, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm, I have to, to, to talk now, but I was going to say that about coffee honey, uh, which is honey from uh, coffee flower. Um, we have done a lot of work on the, on the coffee, on the honey of coffee plantations. And, um, but we are focused more on the, on the pollen diversity into honey. And we find obviously a very strong relation between uh, the um, coffee plantation diversity of trees, uh, the diversity of trees in the coffee plantation and the diversity of pollen into honey. So honey is like um, um, a good indicator of the, of the uh, tree's diversity. Uh, actually, we've submitted recent paper, a paper on the um, um, honey of uh, coffee garden, which is uh, coffee plantations with a uh, high diversity of trees, but we have no, we have never studied the caffeine um, quantity into honey. So I would uh, I would have no data about this. So, 
Uh, the question how much uh, real forest should a coffee plantation have near? Um, I don't think I have an answer. Um, in the the city of Costa Rica, which is um, uh, the one, uh, the study in which uh, they observed uh, the effect of the area of forest, it was about something like 10 hectares around uh, surrounding the, the coffee plantation. Uh, but I guess that with much less, it can be enough. Um, to have a diversity of his visiting coffee flower. Uh, but I don't know if of a study uh, studying string strictly the the area of forest. Uh, yes, honeybees collect nectar and pollen from coffee flowers. Um, that's why beekeepers move bees into into the coffee farms to collect nectar and process it into honey, and bees in the in the process move pollen around. And uh, about this new question, uh, there were only three other species of bees and other insects. There were about eight different species of um, insects vis visiting coffee flowers. Um, what I have to say is uh, that in Veracruz, the conservation of natural vegetation is very, very poor. It's more um, modified than in Chiapas. As I, as I don't know Chiapas very well, but what I've seen from in Chiapas is that um, co uh, vegetation, natural vegetation is better preserved than in Veracruz. Uh, and of course, it it, uh, it relates to the diversity of pollinators. In our study, we tried to, or we measured or, uh, in uh, using uh, satellite uh, photos, we measured the area of um, natural vegetation uh, associated with coffee uh, uh, farms. And uh, first, there was no uh, uh, primary vegetation, that means original forest left anywhere. And second, the secondary vegetation that we observed or were able to measure was very small and very isolated. So I think uh, the lower diversity in Veracruz has to do with the, the lack of, uh, of primary forest surrounding the coffee farms. Well, about this question on the negative relationship between honeybee densities and wild bees, we, yes, well, we only measured that during during the bloom period of coffee. We didn't do it in other um, parts of the year. But uh, there is another uh, study done by another student of mine in, uh, in one of the of the um, coffee farms we used. And what she did was she uh, collected and observed and counted all the visitors to plants that were not coffee, but that were inside the coffee farm. And the diversity of um, bees, which was the group she was studying especially, was very high in that, in that uh, farm. This is the rustic farm. So um, what I uh, would say is that um, honeybees uh, aggressively forage on, on, coffee, on coffee flowers. That means they will uh, push away on, or uh, displace uh, other, other pollinators. But I don't think that it was an artifact. This is what is, I, I, I believe that this is what is happening.
Well, thank you very much, everybody from uh, around the world for uh, joining us. Uh, we will be having another webinar on uh, coffee pollination uh, that will be directed to the African and Asian time zones um, because we're dealing with a crop around the tropics. We have uh, uh, a lot of time zones to deal with, so we will be putting on another one which will be giving some insights into uh, Asian and African uh, coffee production and coffee pollination issues as well. Uh, that has uh, the date for that has yet to be uh, completely set, but nonetheless stand by for that. And I draw your attention to the present uh, webinar, which is available on the YouTube channel. Uh, the address which is given below. So please spread the word around and uh, put the uh, news out that uh, uh, another webinar will be uh, forthcoming and everybody of course is welcome to join that and certainly you can visit us at the University of Guelph on the Canadian Pollination Initiative website to find the link as well. So again I want to uh, thank uh, Carlos and Remy for uh, excellent presentations um, sorry, we had to uh, had, had to truncate um, Carlos is a little bit uh, before he could get to the conclusions, but I think a number of those conclusions were well addressed uh, by the questions at the end. Um, and as was pointed out, with respect to coffee pollination, it is not uh, been appreciated until recently that uh, uh, great yield boosts can be obtained by uh, taking into account and considering conservation, encouragement and introduction as with uh, the Western honeybee uh, into, coffee, uh, into co coffee plantations. We didn't get into the biocontrol aspects of things. That was uh, an, a webinar that was given earlier this morning and that is available on YouTube as well. Even though It's not directed at coffee but at the, uh, the general concept of using pollinators for the biological control of plant uh, diseases and pests. So you may want to have a look at that as well. So thank you very much for all your interesting questions and thank you for joining us. And um, keep in mind, there will be another one to do with Africa and Asia and uh, a lot of the same messages, I'm sure, um, but uh, for a different time zone and people living in other parts of the world. So thank you so much. Okay, goodbye.